Nine times out of 10, when someone comes to you like 100% confident that something is great, it's not good. Mm. And I'm not sure why, <laughs> why that well, is. It's, it's, oftentimes it's because they're, they're, they have like a blind spot for their own work. Once you think, oh, I don't need to learn anything. I think I got it all figured out. It means you're like on your way down. This is another one of my favorite interviews in the series. It is with the founders of Barnstorm VFX which if you're a Blender user, you might have heard of before because they use Blender in their whole studio and they only hire Blender artists. Very unique in the industry. Uh, so they talk about why that is, why they chose Blender, uh, but also why they think possibly uh, some other studios don't use Blender yet. Um, we also talk about like why it's hard to find good Blender artists and what artists should have in their portfolio so that when they apply, they actually get hired at a place like this. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's really chock full of, uh, of good tips and techniques, especially if you want to get into VFX. So, you know, we talk about things like uh, reference assessment, um, little exercises you can do, and what they think is the cornerstone of good VFX. So whether or not you do want to get a job or not, whether you just want to make a short film, uh, it's really, really good information. This is, yeah, it's one of my favorite interviews. Um, and also if you stick around to the end, uh, they give me a short tour of their office as well, which is uh, really cool. Before we get to that though, a short word from our sponsor, which is the sister company, uh, Polygon. So I created Polygon two years ago because I thought that there could be better textures within the industry. Uh, we've since grown it to over 3000 materials, um, as well as HDRs, brushes, and now models. So if you wanna start making better renders, sign up for a subscription and get access to everything you need. But now on to the interview. Yeah, super excited to talk with you guys. Um, as far as I know, you're one of the only studios that have admitted to using Blender <laughs> in a production. Um, thank you, both of you. Thanks very you're much. You're welcome, yeah, we're excited to be here. Yeah, um, first of all, could you tell me um, how you guys know each other? Uh, we met many years ago on a show called Ugly Betty, mm -hmm. um, where uh, Lawson came to lead the in-house team of, uh, of visual effects. I had, in a prior season, been the visual effects coordinator on that show, mm -hmm. um, and we formed an in-house team to, to do the visual effects on the last season of that show, and um, the rest is history. Hmm. It, it wasn't many years ago, really. Yeah, well... It was like relative to nine, ten years ago. I mean, it's more than several. Wow, Ugly Betty's that old. Yeah, two thousand seven. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it we we we. Yeah, I didn't we, get on until season on two. Two thousand eight. Yeah. Um, yeah, we started. Yeah, we were working basically as an in-house team. That had been my background in-house visual effects through some friends of mine, which basically means. As a visual effects artist, you're in with the editorial department of the show. And uh, within reason for shows that are not a huge amount of visual effects, it's something that works to just have an artist or two or three on computers there, get, getting their footage pulls directly from the editorial department, doing work, uh, farming stuff out to facilities as necessary if it's too, too much. So that's what we did. We did that for Ugly Betty, and then we did that for afterwards for a show called Body of Proof, mm -hmm. and then also In Plain Sight, sort of in between seasons of Body of Proof, we were working on In Plain Sight always as an in-house team. We had a situation where because of a change at uh, ABC, um, they did not want to have in-house visual effects artists anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so the showrunner on Body of Proof came to us and said, hey, I can only work with you guys now if you start a company and become a vendor. So that's what we did. We started our company in 2011, uh, kind of under duress. Uh, because we had to, we just had to do it. We did, we didn't set out to do it, but we started Barnstorm in 2011, and then quickly realized that that was actually a good idea because it allowed us to do things like actually hire people mm -hmm. and buy computers under as a company, not as just individuals and stuff like that. And so we realized the benefit of it very quickly. It also allowed us to work on more than one show mm -hmm. at a time because we weren't employees of a of a uh, studio. And it just kind of happened. Yeah, it happened very organically. I'd say we had talked about forming a company prior to that, but then having the necessity of a production insisting on it sort of helps motivate that process through. Right. Um, and yeah, it started out just the two of us. 
We hire a couple people on a project basis here and there, and now we're over 30 people. So wow, and it's I, I get the feeling walking around, it's growing. It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and currently, we're limited by the square footage uh, yeah. the, of this building, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, there's 30 people. Yeah, mm -hmm. wow. Thir 31 or 32 right now, plus a small cadre of freelancers and uh, remote workers. How is it um, dealing with the the fact that when a project's on, you need more artists, but then during that downtime, you got all these artists. How do you deal with that? <clears throat> uh, it's a big challenge, actually. I think that's probably one of the number one challenges in visual effects today. Uh -huh. um, normally, what we try to do is balance what we see coming down with what we have now and say yes or no to projects that we feel like are a good fit. Um, one of our goals has always been to employ people on a full-time staff basis as much as we can, right. um, and then hire on freelancers on a project basis as needed. Right. Yeah. Um, but it is it is tricky and it is challenging. Hmm. Right. We've been pretty good about you know every year we've grown. Early on, we doubled in size probably every year, and we've slowed down a little bit off of that. But we try we try to bring in people that we know are gonna be good and cultivate those people to the best of our ability and find a place for them. One thing that helps with, uh, with being able to retain people project to project is uh, m people who are multi-talented. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, if you're just a compositor or you're just a 3D modeler or you're just a texture artist, there is a limited utility that you have um, especially when projects are always changing, you know, one day I might need this, another day I might need that. Sometimes in the same day I might need two different things or schedule switch around. Now something is due before something else. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of variability in the schedule. And so if someone is the type of artist where they can just jump on something else, it allows us to have them as an employee more easily because we know that they could fill several different areas um, uh, easily. And so we've, we've, and because, you know, our background is essentially as generalists, um, we find that to be a very valuable skill, you know, being a solid uh, generalist and, and just for understanding the other aspects of visual effects mm -hmm. and being able to self-manage it helps if you understand as an artist like what everybody else is trying to do. Right, yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize that as well, like that um, uh, going niche is often a good choice as a career if you're pursuing a larger studio like Blizzard right. with 2,000 employees. But if you're pursuing a smaller studio, it's generalist. Yeah, so, yeah. especially in the early days when it was like five people and a show might say, hey, here's an episode of stuff, but there's only one shot that involves a 3D thing of some kind. Right, yeah. So everyone essentially was a compositor first, and then certain people would say, well, I'd like to do, you know, some hard surface texturing. Some people would say, I'd like to get into, to, you know, water simulations or trees or, or whatever. Um, and those people are also compositing, then as soon as they're, they're, you know, learning a task or they're experimenting with something new or they're good at one other thing already, we can just sort of slot them in and say, okay, when we're waiting on notes on that thing, you can be working on these shots that are already coming and, and balance that way. Right, right. Would you say it's also a good idea to, for them to be a generalist but have a strength or it doesn't? I'd say just you should start with what you really enjoy. Okay. Because that'll generally be what you're best at anyway. Right. Because <laughs> then, you know, when it's, you know, when it's 10 p.m. on a Tuesday and you want to do some tutorials, you do the thing that you like to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I think having a strength is good, um, and you know you have you probably have a core from which everything else sort of gets the the framework in your mind of like how the pipeline sort of works. Yeah, yeah. And people usually start with what they're sort of interested in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think having a strength is necessary, but at least for us, uh, when we were starting, it was always I was always looking at people um, as sort of compositors first, and then whatever else they were doing. Um, I don't think that's necessary when you're getting into it, but for us, that's that was what helped. Mm. Right. I think I think the best strength to have is the ability to learn new things, mm. because even in the several years that we've been doing this, you know, 
the technology hasn't changed hugely, but it's there's a lot of stuff that's that's changed. And oftentimes if people are, you know, there's the person who's really experienced, but like what are they experienced at? Are they experienced at a software package that nobody uses anymore? Are they experienced at a technique that's been superseded by a faster way of doing the same thing? Like what you what you need to be good at is learning new software packages, learning new techniques, learning new plugins, because that's what's always changing. I mean, we are in an industry essentially where I feel like every year I'm dipping my toe into a completely new software package that I've never used before. And it's like, that's, you know, when we started last year on, started using Substance Painter, I went from downloading the demo to purchasing it to using it in production in a matter of days. I didn't like sit there and say, well, we'll learn this whole thing first and then we can start using it. It was just like, we need this now. I'm gonna start learning it. And the first you know, tutorial I did was working on an actual thing that had to go in the show essentially. Wow. So it's, I would probably look back on it and say, oh man, that was garbage, but it, you know, but it happened. Yeah. Are there any uh, positions that you think are underfilled in the market at the moment? Um, well, I wouldn't say there's positions that are underfilled. I feel like generally, especially in LA, and I think partly because of international markets, it's just hard to find good, curious, passionate people. Right. Um, and that, and going back to earlier talking about, you know, what what strength you would want to have or what skill sets you would want to. To have as a generalist, I think too. Like really, the skill uh, is the fundamentals of photography, composition, color, that sort of thing. Because everything else is just a tool. Right. Yeah. You know, you don't. You wouldn't go to a carpenter and say, "Hey, are you you're really good with a hammer, or you prefer the saw?" <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, only high guys who've got sore right, experience. Yeah. <laughs> that's maybe an over generalization, but but that's kind of the thought. Is it that in the next 30 years in visual effects, I'm sure the tools will be constantly changing and evolving at the pace they are now or faster. Yeah. So just having a, a good grasp of the fundamentals first is going to be useful no matter what. What do you think breeds, like cultivates that, that mindset? Because I'm sure you, you know people as well that, uh, that can't keep up with the times. Um, and there are others that are just constantly hungry for it. A curiosity and passion, I think, is the thing, really. Yeah. It's willing to, when you, when you have downtime, what are you thinking about? If you had no assigned task, what would you be doing? Mm. You know what I mean? It, just on your own volition. Mm -hmm. um, and the people that are, that are the ones that are look, reading about stuff and seeing what's going on in the industry and practicing their own work and doing their own things, those are the people that usually keep up with it. Mm -hmm. It's not so much about whether you're interested in the technology or keeping up with the technology or not, um, so much as are you a filmmaker? Do you, do you make your own projects? Do you have your own passions, the things that you're trying to create? You know, because the flip side of, of being versed in the technology or catching up with the technology is the person who's only interested in the newest thing. And it happens a lot in this business and in like, you know, photography, cinematography. You, we all know that that person who like, they love cameras. They don't love photography. You know, they love the, ca they love cameras though. And, and all they do is say they take pictures of other cameras, like, because they're like, whoa, this is the newest, awesomest thing, you know? And, and like, but they're, and they may be a terrible photographer there's people who I know who are new who like they loved all the coolest plugins, but they were terrible with them. You know, like they knew what every little number and slider did, but they couldn't actually produce something that was, you know, good looking. Right. And then there's other people who maybe don't know everything, but they take a plugin that you would say, oh, well, this is a plugin for this, and they use it in a completely different way. And they get something out of it that you're like, oh, that like that's crazy. You can do this with that plugin. It's not really meant to do that because you just you you've done something creative with it. Um, and likewise, again, people who are doing visual effects because they say they're making a student film or a personal project or something like that, and they're like, I have to shoot the film. I have to get the lights. I have to understand how cameras work. 
now I need to figure out the visual effects. I'm doing this. I'm, I'm coming up with ideas to solve problems, and some of them are visual effects problems, and so I'm coming up with visual effects and teaching myself how to do visual effects for a specific purpose, in this case, my film or someone else's film uh, or project, as opposed to saying, like, my job is to work in this software. Mm -hmm. You know, because what they're saying is, well, I, I, I want to get there. The software is, is the part that helps me get there, as opposed to my job is the software. Mm -hmm. And then you get a lot of people who either are just used to using it and don't feel the need to do anything else because they're, they have their experience or whatever, or who are good at working but not at getting anything done, um, or just are not turning out high quality work because they think that, I don't know, they think that they're, they're focused on the process as opposed to the results. Hmm. People who are, come from a filmmaking background are usually focused on the results. Right. But in any naturally distributed population, almost half the people are below average. <laughs> so there's that. Yeah, you're gonna pull that down. <laughs> yeah, something to think about. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, there's a, I totally agree, there's a totally different mindset um, between the people that are, as you said, locked into the software, and they're like, this is my world, I'm a such and such artist, blender artist, whatever. And then there are others that you see uh, working on a project, and they are jumping from this to Marvelous, to ZBrush, right. to Nuke, and it, as you said, picking it up, one day using it immediately on a production to get what you need from it and the next right. thing. Um, and yeah, as you as you said, they usually have a much higher standard um, and they can just work in a production more. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, let's say you had a enthusiastic 18 year old, just finished school and they've got a year, maybe two years off and they're just gonna lock in to try to build up the skills necessary so they can get a job with you. Mm -hmm. What, if you could map out their training regime or what they would get up to during those year, mm -hmm. what would it look like? Make awesome looking YouTube videos. <laughs> okay, what sort of videos? What do you think is fun? And if you're trying to get into visual effects, have it involve visual effects. Um, there's some pretty high quality DSLRs that aren't that expensive. Um, you can do in Blender and you know, with subscription software now, you can probably do everything you would need to do to make your own thing that could look pretty good, given given the, the passion and uh, ability to, to pull it off. Hmm. And I think the first thing you you would make is not it's not going to be great. It's going to be <laughs> it's going to be kind of crappy. Um, but that's okay because you learned more probably doing that than you did reading or listening or watching anything. Mm, right. Um, and I would say simultaneously, you should be either trying to go physically to a place or to meet the people if you're already physically in a place to uh, start getting inroads into the industry. Um, I get a lot of inquiries from people who are like, hey, I live in Nebraska, and here's my my reel. Um, and it's hard for me to say, okay, well, I can see a little bit of potential in this person, but it's not someone that I could employ directly right away, especially if they're off-site and I can't really train them effectively or supervise them efficiently. Right. Um, while I have, uh, like one of the guys that works here, did a phone call similar to that, and I said, listen, if you really want to get into this business, you need to just, on a leap of faith, pack all your stuff in your car, drive to LA, try to get some job to support yourself, and then hit me up when you're here and show me what you're working on. Um, and he's one of our best people now. Wow. So it, it's kind of, you just kind of kind of take a leap of faith sometimes too. So that, that sort of showed to you that they were? They were willing to basically do what they felt like they had to do to make it work mm -hmm. without any guarantee of success. Yeah. And that amount of sort of courage is what's required to get the success in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. And I would say, yeah, definitely making personal projects, doing 
doing stuff that's not just tutorials. Obviously tutorials are great, but like yeah. we've seen all the tutorials. So if you have one on your reel, we will know that you just like copied a video yeah. copilot thing or something. I've definitely seen stuff like that where I'm like, oh, that's that tutorial. And it's like, if you can't bring anything to it except a not as good version of the one that <laughs> was yeah. given, I'm just gonna be like, okay, well I get that. Like, you know, that's that's fine. That's a that's a place to start, and we have all done that. But I don't. Put, I did never put those on my reel. I put stuff that I thought was better than that on my reel. Yeah, and if you're a student, then and you're just doing the minimum to, you know, get a grade on a on a student project in a class. That's probably not an example of your full potential. Right. Right. Uh, and I'd say you could take those skills and just do another one of your own things that is probably one step above that since you can now apply all the lessons you learned making that. Mm, right. Um, and I don't really think it's that expensive or time consuming for someone to do that. To, to this, do day, this day and age, to make their own sort of version of it. Right, yeah. Um, it's not like, and this is a big sea change in the industry, is that it doesn't require a flame bay that you have to, you know, weasel your way in and sweet talk somebody to get hours at midnight on and, you know, and, and get Somebody's like you can just do it with your even just your iPhone at this point if you had to. Yeah, that's a thousand dollars now, but it's <laughs> <laughs> that's worth more than a computer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know what I mean. I agree with it. It's not enough to just spend the time. Like I don't know. There's this sort of this myth that people sit around like like practice makes perfect, mm -hmm. and yes, it does. But if you're working on the wrong thing, it's not going to do you any favors. Working on the right thing is something that a lot of people don't really know is that important. Yeah, my my thing is that. Um, I talk about driving. Well, we talked we've talked about driving before, but my my thing is experience is just the input. It's not an output. Like experience is just things that happen to you. There's a question of whether you learn from it. So you can learn from very little experience. There's some people who have had a lot of experiences that have not learned anything from it. And so it's like, you, it's a combination of things. It's what you do, what happens to you, and what you get out of it. And the one you were gonna mention is like driving. Like we all, well a lot of us, in LA, we're in LA. We all drive every day. Driving every day doesn't necessarily make you a good driver. You know, Lewis Hamilton or somebody who drove, drives F F1, like he was, he was like winning when he was 18 years old. Like he's a better driver than I'll ever be. But he hasn't been doing it as long as I have, so. Right, hmm. and we yeah, and we, and we practice it every day. But, but I'm not really any better than I was a year ago, because because we're probably not, you know, we're not going out to a stunt course and being like, how close can I get to that cone? Do we, you know what I mean? Like, it's or, actually having like very specific yeah. like practice intentions. Yeah. Or yeah, we're just like actively paying attention <clears throat> to what you're doing, which is something that very few people do when they're driving. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's um, what, what could you do to? Um, to improve, like say an artist finishes a piece of work, how do they get the most out of that lesson? I think you you mentioned something, I forget when it was, maybe you were learning, you were teaching yourself drawing, I think, or something like that, yeah. and you said like, the first, you learn the most in the first 80 or 90%, I forget exactly what the statistic was, and then you spend the most time fiddling around with the last 10% and not learning a lot. Yeah. Um, and I think that applies uh, to visual effects as, as equally as anything else. Hmm. Um, which is where, if you were to take something you did and say, just go through it, you know, you should be, don't spend a ton of your time like fiddling with a bunch of things. Go back and say, okay, what is this? How do I critically assess this? And then try to do it again and, and revise those specific things that you were assessing. Hmm. I think one thing we talk about a lot is comparing to references and to real life and things like that. So I think, uh, especially when you're learning, trying to just imitate something that you've seen yourself. Like if you saw a cool effect in a movie or if you saw this or that, like try to make it and then be critical and honest of yourself and say, how close did I really get to that thing I was aiming for? Right. And where specifically in that did I diverge from the quality that I was trying to attain? And is that something that I can get better at or what person or website or tool should I investigate to achieve right. a better result next time? I, I think, I mean, there's different kinds of people. There's people who are more, I'm a more like self-critical person, which is bad when it's applied to other people, I've been told. 
Um, because I just look at stuff and I'm like, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And if I say that to somebody else, they're <laughs> just like, crying. They just, yeah, and it, it's happened. It, it literally has happened. Um, but I, I trust people more that they are, that they have learned something when they say, well, this, I, this, they come to me with something and you're like, well, this is pretty good. It could be better. Eh, this could be better. This could be better. This could be better. Nine times out of 10, when someone comes to you like 100% confident that something is great, it's not good. And I'm not sure why, <laughs> why that well, is. It's, it's, oftentimes it's because they're, they're, they have like a blind spot for their own work. And I'm always like, I want to be the most critical of my own work so that nothing that anyone else would say about it takes me by surprise. Mm. Um, I'd rather know where, and that's just like an affectation, I think, is like I'd rather know what I think could be improved rather than think that I have something that's really good and someone to tell me it's, it's bad, mm -hmm. essentially. And so I think that's, that's a quality because the other thing is, you know, you, once you think you're doing everything right, it means you're not going to learn anything else. Right. It's like and that's like a bad sign. Like once once you think oh, I don't need to learn anything, I think I got it all figured out. It means you're like on your way down, uh, <laughs> you know, because we because the, just the lack of ability to to recognize where you need to grow prevents you from growing. Right. The yeah, I was talking to Alex Alvarez yesterday and he mentioned to me off camera that there's this this group of artists, I think at Blizzard, um, who are like the best at Blizzard of the 2000 people and they meet every week and they are just critical and they are, they feel like they're so behind and they've got so much to learn yeah. and they're like, what's your weakness? How are you going to fix that in the next week? You know, and they, that sounds just, great. I know, doesn't it? That sounds great to me. Yeah. Um, he also said it can also be a little unhealthy <laughs> <laughs> because if you, uh, he mentioned that you don't have to be, like that in order to uh, to get a job. Cause like, you know, there's 2,000 artists at Blizzard. Right. They are the top. Um, you don't have to be that dedicated to get it. I don't know, it sounds like now I'm advocating for laziness, but... You don't have to be the best to be employed. Exactly. That's true. Um, and it's also healthy to have a work-life balance. And if you... Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, well, you don't have to be... You, you don't have to... Here's the thing, the creative process, the creative journey that we all go on, we're never going to get there. There's never going to be a point where any of us are like, that's it. Well, again, unless, unless, you're, unless you're over it, essentially, you're never going to say, I finally achieved success. All that's going to happen is you do some work, it's not good, you get better, and then as you get better, you realize from there, oh, I could get even better. Oh, I could get even better. And so like it's not and that's kind of the that's kind of the point or that's my takeaway of that. It's like even the guys who are the best see room to grow right. and are are conscious of it and that's what that's what keeps you growing is knowing that you have to do it. And there's a certain part of it that's kind of I don't want to say depressing, but it's like you have to be you have to be comfortable with the fact that you're always going to be doing things and want to do more mm. and that the quality that gets you to where you are is the same quality that will continue to propel you forward mm. it's like you know james cameron could have stopped making films as far as i'm concerned after aliens and he would have made you know terminator and aliens and that would be amazing mm. and then he made terminator 2 and then he made titanic and he won an oscar for titanic but like that's not that wasn't good enough and you could be like well come on he's done it he's done it all now and now he's making three more Avatar movies or whatever, but it's like the, the very quality that got him the Oscar in the first place is the, is the reason why getting it is not good enough for him. Mm. You guys just gotta keep going. You gotta keep creating, keep, keep making stuff, keep challenging yourself. Yeah. What's been uh, one of Barnstorm's most challenging projects? Hmm, there's probably a few. Um, I mean, we've had challenges all the way, I think. It it's a, really a question of scale. Mm -hmm. Like, when we were just starting, you know, just getting a couple of scenes of green screen driving was a, was a challenge. You know what I mean? Okay. And then when we're slightly larger, getting, uh, getting Ehrlich to hallucinate 
on mushrooms in the desert was a challenge. In Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then beyond that, getting, uh, getting the Volkshall in High Castle was a challenge. The, the um, who? The Vol? The, the Volkshall. Volkshall is a, is, a, is a large set piece in Man in the High Castle. Right, yeah. Um, and so at e it basically at each stage, um, they were, you were challenged depending on, on what we can achieve. Um, and fairly frequently we have phone calls where it's like, well, they want to do this. Uh, I told them we could, but I have no idea yeah. how we're going to pull it off. So we got to figure that That's, out. <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot where you're either you're on set or something comes up in a meeting and you're like, to yourself, you're like, I have no idea how we're going to do this. I have no idea how we're going to accomplish it. I don't know who would do the work. I don't know what, how long it will take. And you just say like, yeah, we can do that. And you're not being disingenuous because every previous time that you felt that way, you've done it. So right. like that's your, that's your frame of reference is like, well, we always figure it out. I think that oftentimes, you know, productions, film productions make the mistake of thinking that like there's just some VFX way to do things. You know, it's like the VFX button. They joke, it's, I hate it when they joke about that <laughs> stuff. But essentially <laughs> like, it's like, oh, you just got some buttons for that. Yeah, it's like, yeah, a lot of buttons. Yeah. Um, but that it's different every time and it's you're again you're learning something every time it could be just it's the same thing oh it's a green screen but it's like it's not really it's it may be shot differently on a different camera different focal length different tracking different everything so it's like you you express essentially like yeah we can get this done but you don't necessarily know how you're going to do it um and that can be a challenge the biggest challenge, you know, most recently, the biggest challenge has been The Man in the High Castle is a pretty big show, visual effects wise. It has a lot of CG stuff in it. It has a, there was a huge rendering challenge. Um, just scale working in a pipeline uh, challenge. Um, there was a manpower challenge because we chose to use a software that, that, that is not taught in schools and that, that you know is not um tell us about that it's, software <laughs> <laughs> it's not in the uh the visual effects industry as uh, it uh at large uh tell tell you about uh blender you want to know about blender yeah um i'm curious how how did you how did you come to decide on blender as your main um like many things it was an accident uh <laughs> like wd-40 yeah um we so i i started i was always interested in visual effects and i started doing 3d stuff when i was reasonably young i think i got my first uh 3d program when i was like 12 and that was a program called true space oh yeah which i remember that yeah so i started teaching myself that when i was pretty young and then i took a class uh at a facility that was like a, I think it was a visual effects facility and they used uh, new tech products. So they had like video toaster, they had Lightwave and that's where I first um, learned and picked up Lightwave 3D as a, as a 3D program. And then I took some other classes in it and I started working in it. And um, Lightwave never, well I don't say, I want to say never caught on. Lightwave was not one of the main 3D programs that a lot of big companies use, though it was used for a number of projects and there's still artists who use it. And I, once we started our visual effects company, once we started Barnstorm, we were using After Effects for compositing and then I was kind of the 3D guy because I had a copy of Lightwave and I knew how to use it and I could make certain things in 3D. Um, when we did when we had to do 3D stuff, I did it in Lightwave basically. But I found it as a as a program that was not there were not a lot of tutorials for it online. There were a lot of the people who knew it again, like knew it from a very legacy standpoint because it used to be more used than it was at the time. And it was kind of like Maya 3D Studio was the way that people were going. Mm. Um, and I'm sitting over here using Lightwave, like uh, I don't know how long this software is going to be around. I don't, I, I can't just go on YouTube and find a tutorial. Most of the training programs didn't have like, 
if you went on a thing, it would be like 5,000 Maya tutorials and two light wave tutorials. <laughs> and I was like, ah. So, Sign of the times. Yeah, so I was like, okay, well, I guess I got to, I tried Maya when I was younger and I was like, I don't really, maybe I'll, maybe I'll be able to learn it better now because I'm an adult now and kind of know what I'm doing. And I sort of taught myself Maya, but I found it to be very difficult to use. Um, and then we did a couple projects where we needed more 3D than like just one person could provide. And we hired some freelancers and they, to, to do a sequence, it, we, you know, we hired a modeler and a texture artist and like a layout render person. And essentially we said, okay, well, we know you guys use Maya because you were in the industry. And the, and the modeler said, oh yeah, I use Maya, but it's the custom version of it that we used at my old facility. And they actually had their own software that they used for modeling, but I can sort of use Maya. So, okay, fine, you use Maya. And then our texture artist said, well, I don't really use Maya, I use Mari for texture painting. So it's like, okay, well, okay, so we'll do, you get that too, um, <laughs> license that too. And then the layout render person said, yeah, I use Maya, but I don't use Mental Ray. I use V-Ray normally. And we're like, well, can you use Mental Ray? Because that's what comes with Maya. Yeah. He's like, okay, yeah, I'll try and figure it out. And so we had several people basically like, who are all presumably had worked in Maya pipelines, but none of them were like the pipeline expert. And we realized that it's sort of impossible to work in with multiple people if you don't have a pipeline and that everyone's version of Maya is custom and everyone's using all this other software. Um, and in the meantime, I had needed to do a smoke sim and I was like, can I do this in Maya? And I tried to figure it out in Maya. I'm like, oh, it's so complicated. And it's like, well, yeah, but people, and at the time there wasn't, um, Fume. Fume didn't exist for Maya. It was only 3D Studio that it had, eventually it got it. But they were like, well, everyone does, everyone who does smoke does it in 3D Studio and Fume FX. And I'm like, oh man, this is another thing that Maya doesn't have. <laughs> and so I asked a friend, I was like, does, is there any other program that has just like, I just need to do a simple smoke sim. And they were like, oh, Blender has smoke. I'm like, great, it's free. I'll download it. <laughs> Yay. And I and it was like I was like, oh, it's so easy to use. This was like after the redesign. It was like 2.68 or mm. 7 or something. It, it was I came to it pretty late because people were like, oh, Blender, wasn't that all messed up? I'm like, no, this is the new this is after cycles, yeah, cycles had, had come there. out. Um, though cycles did not yet support smokes I or didn't only only CPU rendering for that yeah, at that yeah. point. Anyway. Um and I was like, wow, this is easy to use. And like min moving around in every menu works the same way. Like the same keys that ca allow you to manipulate the viewer also allow you to manipulate the UV, also allow you to manipulate the node graph. It's like I'm using the same buttons, which is not true in Maya because it's all these separate modules that were sort of kludged together at some point. And like, oh, I, I found basically that once I learned something in one part of the program in Blender, if I went into another part of the program that I'd never worked in before, and I could transpose that knowledge over and say, oh, I bet, I bet you know, G is going to cause me to move and, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like really eye-opening. And then I started fiddling around with it. And I was like, oh, there's so many tutorials for it. Like, there's a, there, it's very easy to learn it. And I sort of started being like moving away from Lightwave. And then in the same time period that, you know, these three people had banged their heads together trying to get this stuff out of Maya and not having it look good, I kind of like redid their work in Blender by myself and fixed it um, and was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Um, if I got a, and at the time our studio was four people so it was like, well, if I still have to be the only 3D person, because at the time I still was, I'd rather have a program that's very, rather than having the best program at everything, yeah. because that's not one program, it's, you know, five programs. Uh, 
why not pick the program that has a lot of support and a lot of tutorials and is easy to use mm -hmm. for me and because that will save a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. And then um, eventually other people in the company were like, oh, you're using, you know, Blender and we're like, yeah, it's free. If we have like one copy of Maya, but you can get as many copies of Blender as you want. You can have one at home, you can have one in the office. People started kind of teaching themselves. And even though most of them, again, came from either 3D Studio or Maya, they were like, oh, this is really easy to learn and use. We, sh we can, and I said, well, please, we should start using it then as a, as a company. And that's kind of how yeah, it Yeah, because we had talked about, you know, I think on several occasions, like what do we want the 3D pipeline to be? How do we want to implement it? And because we were small and growing organically, we were like, well, <clears throat> Maya probably is the right choice for a certain scale of facility. But you do need a certain minimum amount of personnel to manage that pipeline. Right. And, uh, and there's a couple, there, there are some good artists that use Maya independently and, and have developed their own thing. And they can exist sort of inside a larger ecosystem, but they have to kind of be the expert that has all of, this, all of the tools. It's very difficult to just suddenly like, let's build a pipeline as an island on its own and have these people work very quickly. That's tough to do. If you have a large capital investment and build out a, a large infrastructure and plan to have projects that can support that, that's probably slightly different. But where we were coming from as a company, it was just so simple. Like you're saying, if someone's like, hey, I'm interested in 3D. It's like, great, just stay an extra two hours tonight. Here's some tutorials that we recommend. And then those people are now in the CG department doing real shots. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, licensing is super simple. Right, so just solved the problem, fixed it. Yeah. 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 So if, if, I, if I really had like a rigorous course that I could put someone on, I think it would involve, it would involve a couple of things. It would involve, like I think you mentioned, Corey, earlier, Learning, um, learning photography, um, learning how filmmaking works, because so much of what we do in visual effects is we're trying to make something look like it was really shot. And if you don't know how things are shot, if you don't know how cameras work, if you don't know how lenses work, focal lengths, anything, how can you make some? How can you match that, right? So learning about how cameras work, learning about how focal lengths work, um, film stocks exposure, um, all the lighting, all the aspects of filmmaking um, is, one, is one part of it. The other part from a CG standpoint or from a Blender standpoint is I think learning good, uh, learning good techniques for modeling, for shading, um, and, re and doing projects that say, hey, here's a real thing you have to make, like you said, you have to make something that either fits into this scene or here's a photograph, now make it in 3D. Um, try and understand how everything works. Um, those are kind of the big things. I wouldn't necessarily say like, okay, we're gonna talk today, we're gonna talk about, um, I mean, eventually I probably would, but to start out, I wouldn't say like, here's how you do an EXR workflow with, you know, with layers and, and um, channels and all that stuff for compositing. Um, those are the things that you can kind of teach in the workplace and different places are gonna do it differently. But what I don't wanna have to teach people is things like when you make a coffee cup, don't make this like three meters tall because <laughs> that's not how big it is. Um, but you know, you gotta say it a lot and or <laughs> things like, you know, just look at a real picture of it when you make it. Uh, understand what the, what the texture is, what the shader would be for this. Um, understand in the, in the modeling that you're not making too few or too many polygons, that you're, you have good, uh, you know, workflow with your loops and stuff, like all those things from a CG standpoint are very important, make a good, do a good UV unwrap because a lot of people that should know better do certain steps, and I'm I'm the worst at this, but I have somebody else fix it for me. Is <laughs> just like being really sloppy about how they make things, um, or again, not referencing the real world. And it's like it's so easy. We have the ability. You could look at a picture of anything on the internet, like anything, the weirdest thing, if you want. You Our can, Google searches. You are can find it, yeah. and so like there's no. 
there's no excuse for not for not having something that looks real. And and again, it's like if you can't if you can't make a real thing look real, how are you going to make a weird alien spaceship look real? Yeah, that's great. I like that. Yeah. That 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 would be a perfect uh boring, but a perfect uh lesson would be like film a table with the coffee cup on it, go around it and then duplicate the coffee cup. You got two mm-hmm. coffee cups. Thrilling, but learn a lot. I I actually I'm so excited by stuff like that. Like I'm doing something right now that I just was telling Corey like this is super super exciting to me. <laughs> is we're doing this we're doing a scene where we we're we're putting together what's supposed to be an old old film. Okay. Um for one of the shows we're working on. I'm sure you know which one. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> so old 16 millimeter film and we it's supposed to look archival, it's supposed to look like it was found somewhere. Hitler's involved? Yes, maybe. <laughs> um, and this is also an example of understanding how filmmaking works. Is um, It's a combination of in-camera edits and splices. So, you know, shooting 16 millimeter film, you're, you, you're rolling on a camera and you roll the trigger down and you roll and then you let go and it stops and you start rolling on something else. Well, what happens when you do that is unlike a video camera where it, the image just stops immediately, the last couple frames, you know, because a film camera, the film is going through at 24 frames per second. It's not just going to stop on a dime. So when you let go of the trigger, it's three more frames advance, but each one is slightly slower. Oh, right. Okay. So I'm rolling 24 and then I let go of the trigger and then I'm rolling at 12 frames per second. And then the next frame is at six frames per second. And then the last frame is at three frames per second. And then I cut. And then when I start rolling again, it has to get up to speed and it happens very fast. But essentially the result, and you can see this if you watch film that was literally edited in camera, is as the frame, as the film is slowing down, it actually makes people look like they're speeding up. Right. And because each frame is in there for slightly longer, the exposure goes up. So there's this sort of ramp in speed and exposure across the cut. And it's like six frames, and I spent hours working on it, but it's like, it's a thing now. And then when they edit it manually, where they just literally snip the film and tape it back together, uh, the tape, the editing tape across the cut, is essentially a piece of scotch tape over the film that's been connected in two points. Um, That sometimes you can actually see the tape across those frames. If it doesn't completely cover the two frames, you can see the tape running right across someone's face. And then the tape itself, if it's old, um, gets sort of milky and is, you know, creating blurriness on the film. So we have all these cuts where some of them are cameras that have started and stopped, and some of them are these physical edits. And I didn't go, I didn't just go through and say, oh, it's black and white film. Let me just put on the grain and scratches filter and go because that, because it doesn't look real. And I know because I went and looked at a bunch of film and used reference and stuff like that. And um, it's little simple things that are actually sometimes quite complicated that make stuff feel real. Mm. And again, even work that you know you might think is not ambitious or is not exciting as an as an artist is important. And that's how we tell it, that's how we can tell if you're a good artist. If you do a really good job on something that is lame and annoying it we know you're a good artist not just because you did that but also because the thing is like even the thing that you like to do the most like even if you're like i love modeling modeling is my favorite thing you will reach a point while modeling where you do not like what you're doing Mm. right yeah like when it's a job it's there's going to be a point where even if it's something that you really love you're gonna be like, I don't wanna be doing this right now, I hate this, this is stupid. And if you can still work hard under those circumstances, you will do a great job. And so if we you know, give something to an artist and, and it's like it's a roto job or something like that, and they do a bad job on it, and they're like, yeah, but I don't really like roto. It's like, well, how do I know you're gonna be good at anything else? Because even the things you do like, you're, half the time working on it, you're probably not going to like it. <laughs> yeah, because of the, the task or the conditions or whatever. And that even goes for people who aren't artists. Yeah. Like a lot of people who are trying to make inroads in the industry, your first job may not be 
as an artist, as an animator, as a compositor. You might be a production assistant or a coordinator or an intern. Mm -hmm. And if you get the wrong kind of coffee or you get the, if you get to put the cream in there, how am I going to imagine that your roto splines are going to be great and then <laughs> imagine that your animation after that is going to be great? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like it goes all the way down to the very smallest, minute task mm -hmm. that if you execute with precision, uh, then, then you've essentially achieved the, the ability to try the next thing. Where do you look for artists? Where should people be posting their stuff? Every, anywhere and everywhere, really. We go to job boards. We, we look on forums. We look on your website for people that are submitting to, to competitions oh, no and way. things like that. Um, we post on our website. People can submit jobs there. Um, yeah, we go to uh, to job fairs like um, oh, like wow. Noman just had one recently. Um, we had a couple of people there meeting new new artists. So there's a lot of avenues, um, but really, really, it's about kind of getting like how do you get how do you get noticed above sort of the the masses of of people because there's a few levels. Like Lawson and I don't have the time really to just if we get 12 resumes to just literally like sit and read like everyone and then go watch their reel exactly. and then call them in and have an interview for an hour like that would literally take us the entire time. So there's a few people that's, that look at stuff and say, okay, this person is still clearly learning. Maybe there'll be someone to check back with in a year or two or this person's fresh out of school, but we're looking for a position of more experience right now uh, or, or whatever. And, and so... Uh, I have, we have an assistant and uh, HR person and they go through resumes and then kind of try to bring us the, the sort of the cream of the crop people. Um, although it also happens too that we kind of find we people either, we as find well. People. Like we're like, oh, I saw this thing and then we send them to them to be like, hey, can we get a pipeline going to meet yeah. this person or bring them in or get a phone call or, or whatever. I had the way that we met someone was a direct Facebook message. Yeah. Well, I don't or, recommend doing that though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it worked. True, but you don't want to get 300,000 no, Facebook I don't, I don't. messages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm never on Facebook, actually, at least professionally, so I would not try that. We directly contact people. Um, we've gotten some people that have submitted to us that have worked that, that get, got our attention. Um, I would hope that we would get more people directly submitting who kind of fit the fit the profile of what we're looking for. Yeah, um, it sounds so easy, right? Like, <laughs> it's, uh, it's <laughs> why, why is there so many artists looking for jobs? And then you talk to the, you, know, you talk to the artists and they're like, there's no work. And you talk to the studio and they're like, there's, uh, there's no, no artists. There's no artists, yeah. <laughs> um, ooh, that, that, yeah. There, well, there's a couple things, I think. Again, I would go back to the, that's not what I wanna be doing. Uh, excuse that I hear sometimes from artists you know I've definitely contacted people who like I liked certain things that they did or or something I was like this is the job that we're this is the job that we're looking for and they're like well I don't really want to be doing this and sometimes very specific things that they like that they want to they basically want to find a niche job and that's the same thing is is like look like we are we're a company that has clients. We don't tell our clients like, nah, I don't want to do that shot. I don't want to do that. I only want to do the cool stuff on this one thing and I'm not going to help you there. Like we have these clients and we say yes a lot because we like working on things and because you know, the way the only way you get the stuff that you really want to do is by doing all the stuff that you don't want to do. Um and you know, we are sitting, we, we, you know, we have a business with, you know, 30 some people and we have budgets that we negotiate with the clients and shots and meetings and try and schedule people and we have, you know, our, the amount of money that we pay and then our clients checks come to us eventually and we're floating all this money and paying people and then like overtime and, uh, schedules changing and then all of a sudden this show is more important than that show and so like as an artist if you come to me and you're like i can do whatever you need to get this done i'm like great because that's what we need we don't need somebody 
who only wants to do a certain thing under a certain schedule, but not on this day, and not under these circumstances, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, these qualifying conditions. Um, because that's, because again, like we, we wanna be able to employ people full time and have them have utility across a wide variety of things so we can keep them employed full time. Mm. You need to understand that the, the job that you're signing up for is to be employed at a company um, and that all the stuff that you want to do for yourself is stuff you still kind of have to do in your spare time for yourself. Mm. You know, like we all have our person, everybody here has our personal projects and things that they stay after work to work on or come in on the weekend or do on their own time or shoot on the weekend or say, oh, hey, do you want to help me on this project? Do you want to help me shoot this thing? Because they're, that's what, that's the thing they're passionate about and they're doing that on their time and they do this work on the company's time essentially. Um, so, and, and again, the people who have the most freedom, the people who work on the coolest shots are the people who agreed to work on the worst shots because they you know, showed us that they can get, get stuff done. And that's like, we really need somebody, if you're gonna work on a very important shot that our reputation is riding on, you have to, we have to trust that you can do it and that if there's a problem, you're not gonna say, oh, I got this thing, I, gotta, I, wanna, I don't wanna work on a weekend, like that you, that you are so committed to getting it that you will do what it takes to get it done. Um, so that's, that's incredibly uh, important, um, I think, from, from artists is to understand, and again, all the best ones are ones that are like, I can do it, I'll do, do what it takes to get this done, this is what, you know, this is, this is what we have to do, we're doing it. Um, that's important because that's how we always were. That's how we, we do it ourselves. Um, and then, uh, yeah, not, not overestimating one's own level of experience mm -hmm. um, is important. Um, Explain um, that. Uh, it kind of goes back to, you know, once you think you know everything, you, you, learning. you stop learning or, or you, you've gotta, you're, you're kidding yourself if you think you don't have more to learn. So uh, people who, um, again, people who value learning, who know that they're, they're growing in some area. You know, if an artist comes in and we're t talking to them about, you know, oh, here's the software packages that you say you're good at, and you say, how would you rank yourself in After Effects? We ask, we ask artists to self-rank themselves in software packages, among other things. Well, I got a 10. Out of five, five I think. the scale yeah. goes, yeah. Okay. And anyone who ranks themselves a five at something, we know is just full of it. <laughs> because it's just, I mean, unless you're the best person ever, like, okay, would you rank, what would you rank yourself in Blender? Well, I'm the guru, so. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> we can give you a one to 10 scale. <laughs> one to 10? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you can use decimals. <laughs> Seven. Okay, See? so yeah, so if so if you met someone who said they were a ten in Blender, would you believe oh, them? No, yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. I don't think it's Ton like, Rusendahl is a Yeah, 10, exactly. Right? So it's it, that's again, it's like understanding and or if we say like, hey, what are you trying to improve in right now? They say, Oh, I'm working on ZBrush or I'm doing you know, I'm I'm doing this or that, or I'm learning substance painter or substance designer, I'm doing tutorials every night or something like that. Like that's a really good sign. Um is someone who even though they believe they have a level of knowledge in something, even if they're not working on raising that, they're working on raising it somewhere else. Um, and just again, the, the quality of the work, if someone's done something, you can just tell, you can tell when you look at stuff, if they have attention to detail, if it's high quality, if it's rendered well, if it's lit well, like it. Now I think I just changed my answer to six. Okay. <laughs> now as we talk about it, I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, so I think it goes. It goes to value, really. If you think of your, if I think of this company as its existence essentially depends on the value that it's adding to the shows that it works on. And for the clients to hire us, we have to be doing something that gives them uh, that adds value to their show, and we have to be doing it in such a way that's efficient and cost effective. And the reason they ask us to do things is essentially to take things off of their plate. 
they say, hey, these, this is what we've got to do. You guys need to figure this out for us, essentially. And they're not just going to come to us and say, here are the perfectly prepared tasks that we have for you that everyone understands exactly what needs to be done and the creative direction is completely thought out ahead of time and it should only take you a few days to do. It's like it never, it's not that way. Uh, and so I think of the company, like if you think of the show as hiring the company, you think of the company as hiring a person. The person that's coming into the company has to do that exact task for the company, which is to add value for us to add value for the clients. Hmm. Like the, the companies don't exist to employ people. They employ right. people because those people are adding value to the services or products that that company is providing. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking for a job, you have to phrase your proposition essentially as this is what the value I'm bringing to the organization. Mm -hmm. Not explicitly, this is my goal in my life. Mm -hmm. Your goal in your life or your dream should be framed in the context of what your contributions to people or organizations are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And that's how you should be thinking of yourself entering the workforce, really. Mm. I think another, I'm not sure if we're going to talk about this, but one, one of the things I just thought about is, is you know, what, um, what an experienced artist does that an inexperienced artist doesn't. Mm. Should we talk about that right of now? Of course, go for okay. it. Okay. So one of, the, one of the huge things that is the mark of an experienced artist is that they find a way to make their problems simpler. Whereas an inexperienced artist tends to take very simple problems and add complexity to them. Can you give an example? Um, oh my gosh. I feel like I should be able to give a bunch of examples. I'll start more general. Um, somebody who's really good at, uh, at, uh, as a compositor or a CG artist or whatever, oftentimes what they do, what makes them good is not that they essentially brute force their way through big challenges. It's that they find a way to break them down into simple steps or, mo or move around them or something like that. Whereas a, an inexperienced artist will create a comp with you know 50 layers in it to do something that an experienced artist could do with like five layers. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that the experienced artist is somehow like better at working with a bunch of layers. Mm -hmm. It's that they've simplified the problem. Um, what is an example of that? What is a good example of that? Well, I, I don't have an explicit like shot or technique example, but I just know like um, when you open a, this is a nuke script, for example, if it's just a spider web of madness in there, it just means that someone was trying a bunch of stuff and experimenting and wasn't quite sure what they were doing. Yeah. And it just became, and the complexity on complexity, and then the next day you come back into that and you can't even understand what you did well enough. Yourself. Yourself again to know like how to proceed. Yeah. Um, and so what a good artist would do instead is say, okay, I've, I've, I've I, I did, you know, experimentation is necessary sometimes and important, so they would maybe break off a tree and do some experimentation of a color correction or a track or a, whatever it is, and then say, okay, this is kind of what I'm going to go with, and then bring that back in, delete the other stuff, and, and keep that, what they've sort of decided on there. If they want a reference for something, maybe put it in a backdrop and label it. Uh, but but just having having that workflow or, or something similar to that so that you can or, and and asking yourself if someone else was to open this project mm -hmm. would they you know given a few minutes understand sort of how it's constructed it's a little bit like software development you know they they say you should you should uh, you should note your code essentially as if a stranger is looking at it because six months from now when you come back to tweak it you are that stranger yeah right you don't it's gonna be so foreign that uh, that you'll need your own notes to to figure it out um, so that that's an example of how that how that sort of manifests itself oftentimes and and projects always get more complicated as they go you know I'm sure you're familiar with this you know that last 10% is where everything gets its most complicated and so oftentimes when we're looking at versions of work that people have done, what you want to do is you want to create a very strong, very simple 
first version because you're going to improve it in your second version and the project's going to get a little bit more complicated. And as the project gets more complicated, it's going to take you longer to work in it, mm -hmm. either because of render time or just nodes and things and process. And then you're going to make another version. And that version is going to be a little bit better and a little more complicated. And every new version you make that's more complicated, it slows down the rate at which you can improve it and iterate it and make changes. So if you started out in version one with a very complicated project, by the time you get to version four, it's going to be so complicated that it actually resists being <clears throat> improved because it's actually too complicated. Because I've talked to artists before where you know they, there's something there and I'm like, oh, well, this thing looks a little bit too sharp. Can you, make, can you blur it a little bit so that it fits into the scene better? And they say, oh, I can't do that. <laughs> you're like, why can't you do that? And like, what? they're like, well, because it's under this layer, which is inside this, which is composited on this, which is done on this. And then it's like, all I'm asking for, I'm not asking for something complicated. I'm asking for something very simple. But because they didn't structure their project in the right way, the simplest thing is like impossible to do. And at a certain point, if you start and it's not good at the beginning, but it's also too complicated, you eventually reach a point where it's like you can't get there from here because it's so complicated that improving it to the level it needs to be would require so many more versions and so much more complexity that it would just dis destroy it. So you, the, sometimes it's actually faster to go back and say, okay, well now we know kind of what we want. We're gonna start over completely and try to achieve it again. And really good artists have the ability to do that from the beginning. Their projects eventually get very complicated, but they only get complicated right at the end. And they're not a great Nuke artist or a great Blender artist or a great After Effects artist because they made a complicated project. You should never be proud <laughs> of the number of layers or voxels or nodes or polygons that are in your scene. It's, it's never a metric of success. It's like taking a picture of your camera. Right. You, like I feel like that, like when you're learning, it's easy to have sort of a, like a badge of honor. Like, oh yeah, we had to render all those polys and we had, it was so heavy. And that, like, that is not a, a benchmark by which you should measure whether or not you're doing well. You should measure your success by how real something looked and how fast you're able to achieve it. Yeah, I like that. It's really pretty simple. Yeah. So this building is two stories. We used to uh, just work in a part of it, but now we occupy the entire space. Right. Downstairs and upstairs. Nice. This is the I.O. room that I think you guys have named the Armory. Oh, there we go, yeah. So this is our edit, uh, oh yeah. It's probably not gonna work. Can I shoot you? You can, let's see what happens. Oh, it worked. <laughs> so this is the editorial and I.O. room. This is where all of our footage polls come through here and all of our deliveries come back out through here as well. Uh, after we do our visual effects work, we finish our shots. We look at them on the TV in here, um, usually with myself or Corey uh, and the coordinators and the artists and everybody uh, to critique them and make sure that they're good to send out. Nice. Okay. And uh, I've never held a shot of the real sad Neo. Oh yeah, sad Keanu. That's a 3D print. My favorite 3D print in the, oh no, there's, there's a new favorite 3D print in the office now. It's Brian's head. So we have an artist here, actually two artists named Brian. Oh hey, here he is. Oh my goodness. Oh, look at that. All right. <laughs> Pretty accurate. <laughs> So this is a bullpen where a lot of our artists are working right now on all of our various shows. So what do the guys here do? So I believe everyone down here is currently working on compositing tasks, mm -hmm. either in After Effects or Nuke. Uh, so in here is our kitchen and break room. Uh, this is where everyone goes to hang out when they're not working, get a snack, eat lunch. And then we, uh, we play board games in here on Friday nights. And then we also, um, we do everybody's laundry. We have a laundry service. Wait, really? Yeah, we have a laundry service. Dude, serv seriously, I thought yeah, it was a joke. No, it's not a joke. Like, like Dwight in the office. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we do everyone's laundry because the last thing you want to do after you've worked all week is like go home and do all your laundry on the weekend. So this is the clubhouse. This is sort of our 3D department. Um, almost all Blender in here. Uh, 
We also use 3D Studio Max and Houdini. What sort of machines do people have? Most of the computers in here are actually gaming PCs. And I think Casey's machine has, what does yours have in it? Two Titan Zs. Two Titan Zs. Um, so not all of them are like that, um, but they're all of a decent strength, essentially, for, uh, for compositing and 3D work. Nice. What is that? So this is an, this is an elephant. <laughs> um, there was an episode of Silicon Valley. Oh, ruined. <laughs> so there was an episode of Silicon Valley last season where Gavin Belson kind of parades all these animals. Oh, right. We wanted the production to know, oh, the elephant is this tall. The elephant's head is this big. This is how far you have to walk to go around it. So we printed out this large aid that they just put on a C-stand. Um, and we kept it. Silicon Valley seems, they're big on animals. The, the monkey? The monkey, yeah, we did the monkey. <laughs> it's fun stuff. All right, this is another one of the rooms where we do compositing. So everyone here is working on one or more of our shows doing comp work. So this is the, this is the Barnstorm visual effects logo. Right. It is the famous uh, inverted Jenny stamp which is like the most valuable stamp in the world. We're popular among philatelists, <laughs> or whatever they, I think that's what a stamp collector is called. You know, Corey comes from a family of uh, pilots, and uh, we were kicking around names and we wanted something, but we took, um, you know, the name Barnstorm because we started out, we were always moving around, and that's what barnstorming is. So, and we just felt like it was like the perfect logo for the, for the company. It just, just felt right, so. Thanks, guys. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. If we could hire like three, four more really good Blender people, like we would probably tomorrow. <laughs>